my hope for for all humans is is that they don't have to wait for that cosmic kick in the butt to start making change to their lives, which is why we start the book with, you know, how do you know when it's time to change your life? And I got a really big wake up call in that when I was in my early thirties, living in New York, working at Amazon, you know, kind of living that stereotypical life. And, you know, if you asked me at that point in time, what brought me joy, it was probably going out for margaritas after work. Um, and I had gone to my dear friend and godmother of our, our second daughter, Grace's Saturday morning yoga class at Strala Yoga with Tara Stiles. And after class, I called Jason and was like, I'm feeling a little out of breath. Can you meet me in the city? And we walked around the West Village and after a short walk, you know, decided we need to go home. So we took the A train home and this particular station has very steep steps. So as I was climbing out of the station, I collapsed and then eventually got out of the station and we called my doctor and I did what so many women especially can do is, is that I gaslit my symptoms. I was like, that was no big deal. I'm dehydrated. It was a beautiful day in New York. I also had no desire to go to the ER on a beautiful day. Um, and I spent the rest of the week weekend just completely out of char character, lethargic, napping, and come Monday morning, Jason said, the only way you're going to work is if you stop by your doctor's office on the way. And within a few minutes, he's like, you're having a pulmonary embolism. Um, wow. Go straight to the NYU ER. And I was so bewildered. He gave me a little sign, said, I'm having a pulmonary embolism. Unclear if he didn't think I'd be able to communicate what was happening once I got there, if he was worried about me getting there. Um, but once I got there, there were showers of clots in my lungs. And I was really fortunate to to be alive. And it was a, a long process when you are 32 and otherwise in seemingly good health and you have a PE, you know, there's a battery of tests that's happened. And I think what's important to note from a PSA standpoint is I didn't have any genetic predispositions for clotting. You know, they didn't really find anything in my blood work that was alarming. Uh, and the likely cause of my pulmonary embolism was being on birth control pills, which I had been on for about a decade without any issues. And I had done a very short flight to, ironically, Miami um, the week prior. Uh -huh. And I remember when I was at my student health center in college, kind of getting um, on birth control pills, I took like a multiple choice test. And there was so many questions about not getting pregnant for proper usage and really a small amount of focus on kind of the risks. And I think I had heard of risks, but associated it with people who smoked, people who were significantly overweight and, and, and really minimized it in my brain. And I think... I'm not as current on the statistics at the time. It was about one in 10,000 actually caught in the pill. But when I wrote an article on Mind Body Green that went viral, you know, I heard from so many women, sisters, cousins, aunts who had had a woman in their family or their community have a similar experience. So I, I do think it feels a lot more common um, than it actually um, shows in the data. And um, I'm not against pharmaceuticals, but I'm definitely more thoughtful about the ones that I, I put in and, and read all those side effects because um, every body is so unique and, you know, they're still discovering, you know, what actually can, can make us all be susceptible and be vulnerable to some of these side, side effects. But it started this long healing journey, which was for me, a game of Marco Polo in the 2010s in New York, which was like a wellness Disneyland, there was no shortage of things to try. Um, and some of them were super fulfilling. And in others, I found kind of the underbelly of the wellness world. And, you know, I experienced the best of the best. And I experienced charlatan healers who were going through their own work and, you know, it manifesting in ways that, you know, they were taking advantage of a hugely vulnerable population when you're this edge case, who's on this healing journey and at, you know, your lowest point of self-esteem with your own relationship with your own health. Um, so a lot of the joy of well-being is kind of the roadmap I wish I had when I was trying to, you know, get back to baseline, get closer to that 80%, um, and have it have the actions I was taking yield a higher ROI faster. Yeah. And it's so important. <clears throat> like, I think that's why what I'm hearing from your story or what it's reminding me is that like our bodies are so resilient and, and, you know, I love that you like there's wake up calls at different volumes along the way. Right. And a lot of them you ignored until there was one that literally took you to the floor and you couldn't ignore it anymore. And then that, like Michael Beckwith calls it the cosmic two by four smacking you across the head. It starts with a little tap on the shoulder and then a whisper in the ear and it gets louder. And then it's like, bam, you know, and then you have a diagnosis. Um, and I really 
believe that if you just follow the fundamentals in the joy of well-being, which again are so accessible and it's something that everybody could do with just their tweaks in their routine, their lifestyle choices, their diet choices, their movement choices, um, and you know, getting back into social connection, just the fundamentals. You're putting yourself in the best, um, the highest resilience, even if you're just at that 80%. And you can always turn it up that extra 20 by investing more resources and time and doing the fancy things that you tried. Um, but if if we get to that 80% baseline of just like, well-being and health and 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 foundation like your body can handle so much and hopefully you never get to that place where you get a cancer diagnosis or autoimmune and and so i just know that so many people listening right now are dealing with a mystery illness or dealing with so many things that are trying to heal and and when you're on a healing journey for sure that's the time that you need to be rigid but if you are just dealing with some symptoms or brain fog or some fatigue like just that this book can reset you into that place of resilience and a lot of your stuff might resolve on its own. And then you can like have a baseline where you have the clarity and the energy to actually make, you know, clear decisions of what your body needs to heal and resolve fully, whatever you're dealing with. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. That's good <laughs> to hear. Cause that's, the, that's the message. And I think, you know, there is this idea sometimes in our space and I think it's driven by media, like we're shooting for perfection Yeah. and I've fallen victim here. You know, I went from, you know, I had this crazy marker of homocysteine, which is a marker of, of inflammation in the body. And if you have the MTHFR gene, which almost half the population does, you probably have a problem here. And that's like my PSA here, like get your homocysteine measured. Because homocysteine is homocysteine's inflammation in, in, in the cardiovascular system, and homocysteine at high levels could lead like lead to a blood clot, like a pulmonary embolism, like Colleen had, or a stroke. And so it's really serious. And I discovered in doing like basic blood work that I had sky high homocysteine, sixty three. Like so, it should be under fifteen. Like my doctor Frank Lipman thought it was a mistake. He was like, take it again. Uh, I took it again. It wasn't. And like, long story short, through supplementation, I got up to 10 and like, there was nothing you can do with lifestyle modification here. It's like, I'm not methylating B vitamins. And so, you know, for me after this, I became obsessed with, I was like doing blood testing once a quarter. And then finally, Frank said to me, he was like, what are you doing? Like, stop, like, just do it twice a year. Like you're, you're never going to get the perfect labs. And you know, it's like, you know, you're right. It's like, once you get perfect, there's so much we don't get, you know, I get hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. you know, it's never going to be perfect. Do it twice a year, understand your baseline and kind of move on. Otherwise it's just, it's way too much. Yeah, I know. And as obviously young parents, I have a four-year-old, oh. you know, there's such a, like, as we've learned about this stuff for ourselves and we want to have, we want to set the health foundation for our kids and, you know, model for them and repair and like reparent ourselves and do all the things, but it's just so like, you can't be perfect. So like what it's the last four years have taught me in complete overwhelm in this chaotic society we live in, that's a total circus in my eyes right now. Like just trying to survive is a, you know, just like forget thriving. I'm just trying to survive. And I have all the health right. resources in the world. So imagine, you know, my, my, I, I can't even, I'm trying to be honest here. Like it's still hard, you know, when I have support yeah. and so many people don't have support and so what, like your daughter's name is Grace. My daughter's middle name is Grace. And that's just oh. been like the thing, like as you're on a healing journey or a parenting journey, or even, you know, just making changes in your life, because there's so much change happening, you know, just energetically in the world right now is just remember like grace, which is why I love that Bruce Lee quote that you had, like, be like the water, you know, like you just have, that's like joy is, is fundamental. And then as you're trying to roll out this new way of being and make changes, like stay in grace with yourself and just like do the best you can. Yeah. And I think you have to, you know, just acknowledge what life stage you're at, you know, with two little kids on our end in a business, like this is not the time for my elaborate wellness routine. And when I move into my you know, later decades of life, sure, I look forward to hitting those hour and a half yoga classes again and, you know, enjoying more frosting. But like now it's all about integration, finding ways where something is integrated into the day and not added as like another thing to do because I I have such a complicated relationship with the word wellness because I found it unable at this life stage to be able to 
um, you know, kind of do it in the way it's perceived on social media, which was another part of our intentional move to well-being, just because that word's gotten so hijacked. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the stuff that works the best is the fundamentals. And we got to bake the cake before we can put the frosting on. So how do we just talk about that stuff a little bit more? And the stuff that works the best is the stuff you enjoy doing. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.